good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Professor Juliet Kayyem and Gretchen Rubin. FAN's a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 175 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. Now for introductions. Juliet Kayyem is a professor in international security at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she is faculty chair of the Homeland Security and Security and Global Health Projects. Her previous books include Security Mom, My Life Protecting the Home and Homeland, and co-authoring Beyond 9-11, Homeland Security for the 21st Century. She's the CEO of GRIP Mobility, a technology platform that provides audio and video capabilities for rideshare companies to increase the security for drivers and riders. In government, Professor Kaya most recently served as President Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. And before that, she was Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick's Homeland Security Advisor. She's got a long resume, You've got one more point though. She is a CNN on-air national security analyst and is a weekly guest on Boston's NPR program. Another person with a long resume, Gretchen Rubin, is the author of many books, including the blockbuster New York Times bestsellers, Outer Order, Inner Calm, The Four Tendencies, Better Than Before, and The Happiness Project, which spent two years on the New York Times bestseller list. Her books have sold over three and a half million copies worldwide in more than 30 languages. On her top ranked award-winning podcast, Happier, she discusses happiness and good habits with her sister, Elizabeth Kraft, and she is a frequent columnist for Oh, the Oprah Magazine and makes regular appearances on CBS This Morning. Fun fact, Ms. Rubin started her career in law and was clerking for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor when she realized she wanted to be a writer. That's uh, welcome, Juliet Kayyem and Gretchen Rubin. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Lonnie, and thank you everyone for having us here tonight. I am so excited to get a chance to talk to Juliet Kayyem about her excellent new book, The Devil Never Sleeps, which is sadly extremely timely, um, now more than ever. And in a minute, Juliet, I want to talk to you about the events of today, the Brooklyn uh, subway shooting. I know you have many uh, kind of reflections on what we can learn from that and, and, and sort of how the situation has unfolded today. But before we get into it, like, let's have you sort of explain a little bit of like how the foundation of how to even think about disaster. Like you have this thinking about the boom. Right. How, what, how do we think about the boom? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Gretchen, for, for being here tonight. Actually, I, I view us sort of in the same field of sort of, you know, helping people get managed things. I think, yeah, I think well, that's like true. That. Yeah. And, and to get to less bad, I think you're happier. I'm sort of in the less bad uh, metric. I want to make things less bad. And, well, and, thank and you also, I think when people feel less anxious and more prepared, they, they do feel yes. more confident and more. Uh, no, I think, I think yeah. we are similar in that, that, that sense of agency, which we'll talk yeah. about giving people a sense of agency in their own lives. Uh, so, um, and thank you, Lonnie, and to, and to everyone there and the sponsors for organizing this great event. I've been texting with Lonnie all day because I, I have, I, I like to say about CNN, I'm, I'm, I'm never on and then I'm always on. And today was an always on one because of the events in Brooklyn. I appreciate this first question because the, the book had a, sort of a fundamental uh, theme uh, and, and a goal, which was to, 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 to unearth, expose, give some clarity to this world called disaster management, which people in my field are really bad at explaining. And I wanted to do that for you know, a reason so that we can begin to, to, to judge success differently. So I set down, I set at the beginning pages, I set a way of thinking about the world because we're quite simple people in disaster management. There's only two periods of time. There's, uh, there's the left of boom and the right of boom. So let me just explain those uh, clearly the, the boom itself is the devil. I'm agnostic as to what the bad thing is. So the book goes through centuries of disasters, tragedies, crises from the Trojan horse to, I think I get as close to Surfside uh, in Miami as recent as Surfside. Left of boom is everything that we do to try to stop the bad thing from happening. And right of boom is all the response and recovery capabilities. And we tend to view success as nothing bad happening and failure as something bad happening. We're very binary, right? In the way we talk about it. And, and I just came to believe over a long career in this, that this was a 
really bad way to view success. It was a bad way to talk to the American public and, and or to any public in a world in which lots of bad things are going to be happening and COVID just being one of, of many. And so I spend eight chapters describing to people, institutions, CEOs, uh, moms and dads from, from, from base level all the way up, uh, how to learn to fail safer. And I mean by that, that is to accept we will be on the right side of the boom, but there's much you can do to make things less bad. And I wanted to give people that agency because because otherwise people tune out or freak out. And that's that's not a good place to be. And you also explained that there's a difference between yeah. crisis, disaster and catastrophe. And I think that's also kind of a helpful way to think about right. um, different kinds of events. Yes. So, a, so all of them are occurring right of boom, right? So the crisis is something is disruptive, but it doesn't result in a lot of damage. So think about the landing of the airplane on the Hudson, Sully Salzberger, right? That's a crisis. That was three minutes of a crisis, but he, but he performs successfully. He loses capacity of the engines and lands on the Hudson so that you're measuring success by the fact that no one died. Everyone got out alive. No one cares about the airplane. Uh, a crisis is when the boom hits and your capacity to respond is limited, systems are down, and, um, and you, would, you would anticipate some disruption to what this I call- This is disaster, you said crisis. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, disaster. Uh, disaster, right, is, is, is a disruption to a, to, a, to a core capacity of the institution, its ability to, to fly or its ability to, to uh, drill oil, whatever it might be. Thank you for clarifying that. So you have the crisis, the disaster, and then the catastrophe. Catastrophe is just simply a crisis where you are no longer able to manage what we call stupid deaths. And I do not mean that as the victims. I mean it as the people who did not have to die if you had made some investment in in try, if one had made some investment in trying to protect them. So a perfect example of a stupid death is, is the inability to get water or food to communities that have survived, say, a hurricane or tsunami uh, uh, that didn't die from the water, didn't die from the wind in the hurricane case. So I take those three and I say, okay, look, they're all relatively the same. And what we want to do is be sort of closer to the crisis. And we certainly don't want to be at a catastrophe, because uh, those are unmanageable. If I could add one more thing to this, it's uh, if there's anything out of this book besides hopefully helpful lessons, it's also cocktail chatter. Uh, I've been in this field a long time. I had never looked up the word disaster. Uh, of course, I knew what it meant. Uh, and catastrophe has the same basis. Both come, dis means not or mis misalignment. And astro, of course, from the start, so disaster. It was viewed that the disruptions on Earth, whatever they were, you know, before cyber attacks, but now cyber attacks and pandemics and terrorism and, of course, natural disasters, were the result of a misalignment of the stars. And that puts humankind in a very passive uh, position. Same with catastrophe. And I came to see that that word had really limited our capacity to feel ownership or agency, even on the right side of the boom. So, so I'm sure everybody is very eager to hear what yeah. what your take is on the events of today. Like, given your framework, how would you how would you evaluate or how would yeah. you how would you think about what's going on? So this is in the right side of the boom. This is a good day. I hate to say it, and I can say it here because I'm not a public official anymore. You know, in the way that you measure success, something bad happened. We will inevitably learn more about what the police knew. I do think the police know something. Uh, they were quick to say that it wasn't terrorism, which makes me believe they know who the suspect is already, or they, they've announced a person of interest already. Uh, the response seemed to be very adequate. People who were shot made it to hospitals relatively soon. This is not something that was going to stress the New York hospital systems. There was only, I think, 16 people that required hospital help. So it wasn't like a 9-11 or something. Uh, uh, and it, sound like, it sounds like response capabilities in the investigation have gone so quickly that I'm talking to you 11, 12 hours later, about 12 hours later, no one's dead, a suspect is essentially named, and as importantly, the, the, the trains are running again. 
Whereas you measure your ability to respond by how long is this disruption? So I think that those are all good. And all of that is because New York is terribly sophisticated understands how to do these things. You can't have the subway system down for too long. I think the thing I'm looking at on the bad side or something that I've been raising on the air is, uh, is all of our protocols learning after 9-11 is you want to stop services after the first disruption because let's say in this case that the train, you certainly didn't want trains coming into the subway stop uh, when this was happening because you just don't want them entering a, a, a at that area. There's some speculation he may have been able to exit through his subway. Uh, so that's something that just in the after action learning, that's something that I'm looking at. It, it appeared that the, that the subway kept running. You just don't want that during, you know, when you're essentially at, at the equivalent of ground zero for this event. But all in all, I think we're going to see closure within 24 hours. Which is remarkable. remarkable. Um, well, one of the things that you talk about over and over in the book is that it's sort of it's one of the human part of the problem is people, right? Everything would be easy if it were for people. And so human nature keeps kind of asserting itself. Yeah. And one of the things that human nature does is we sort of learn very well the last lesson. Yeah. Um, do you feel like in this case, maybe there's like a lesson that it's it, 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 it's hard to know what lesson to apply right. this moment and that that's part of what causes confusion? I think so. I think I think that if there if there is a lesson, if there what, what we call after action reports or uh, whatever you want to call them, if there is a lesson, it, it is probably going to be once again at the moment of the boom, who was making what decisions about the about bringing more people to the crisis. You simply don't want to do that. So I do think that that's going to be a key area. But you you raise a larger point. I mean, no one died today, but one of the things that I try to highlight in the book through history and, and through where we are now is that and what disaster studies is and I'm, as it, once again i'm exposing my profession right i want people to know what it is that people like me do in the private sector and the public sector is that our that people die in a disaster is a given uh how they die is actually our responsibility to them and and, and so the distinction is important um in hurricane season in the United States now, most people die. When we say 50 people, 160 people died in hurricane season, most people died from carbon monoxide poisoning. People aren't drowning anymore. Just, yeah, right. they are. That's what I was writing. They're not drowning anymore. That we've gotten, let's just put it this way if you want to know, does preparedness work? We've gotten really good in hurricane preparedness. We're calling them earlier, we're evacuating people. So if that's the case, right, then I can avoid those deaths, but I have to learn that lesson first. Otherwise, I'm going to focus on the wrong thing. So now I want everyone to notice this next hurricane season or upcoming hurricane season. When you go on websites to learn if you're in New England or wherever, wherever people are calling into, when you go on to websites, the, the, the number two thing, the number one is the hurricane, the number two is carbon monoxide poisoning. The same is true, uh, Gretchen, for blizzards. People don't die of snow. Yeah. They, they die of carbon monoxide poisoning. So now that's a lesson I can take. So that's sort of the obligation of disaster studies is then to say, okay, if I know that, then I can empower you, right? Don't worry about, well, worry about the hurricane, of course, but worry as much about what you're turning on in your home or in the car, because that's more likely to kill you and your children than uh, than the snow or the rain. And that's that's the sort of agency that I, I wanted, you know, that wanted to give people was actually it's not as, oh, I'm dead or alive and it's all luck and it's just a matter of the start. Like it's actually no. I mean, we we individually and and of course governments, if they can do better, uh, can actually make things you know, the very, the very scientific evaluation of criteria of less bad, less bad. It's not a bad standard. Well, speaking of hurricanes, something you don't talk about the, in the book, but that I've wondered is, do you feel, I mean, one of the things is giving people warning. And one of yeah. the things that's sort of curious about something like a hurricane is like, there's often a lot of advanced warning. And I feel like in a way that kind of makes people feel like it's under our control, yeah. which it's not. And also there's, I think sometimes like, there's this tension between like maybe the 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 news wants to like make it sound like really dramatic because that gets people watching. And then you have the actual services that are trying to like be very careful about, you know, trying to get people to the right conservative, right. but you know, realistic level. 
And then you've got people, and you talk about this in the book too, is human nature, which is a near miss kind of teaches people the wrong lesson no, instead of being like, wow, we came really close. It's like, whoo, I guess we don't have much to worry about. And so, so do you, how do we think about the idea of warnings and sort of like understanding when, yeah. like not getting, not getting too dismissive, like, oh, they always are just, you know, making a big right. deal out of every little thing. Um, but then also, um, you know, uh, not getting too swept up with things right. where, you know, you don't, this is, this is important, but it's, you know, you don't have to like get eaten up with anxiety. That's exactly right. So this is the way I, I talk about these warnings and also the near misses. So I should just say once again, you know, and, and, uh, uh, you know, welcome to the world of disaster management. These are terms and ways we're thinking about communities that, uh, the American public should know about, right? I mean, why why don't they know about like the near miss fallacy? The near miss fallacy came out of studies of the NASA uh, uh, Challenger disaster. Uh, it's a it's a terminology that describes institutions or communities that begin to justify every near miss, right? The 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 the, the uh, normalization of deviance, they call it, right? Every near miss as a as a uh, sign that the system is holding rather than red lights that you've got something terribly wrong. And the space shuttle Challenger, there's an O-ring that was the cause. People will remember this. It was the cause of the, if you thought, okay, what caused it? It was the O-ring contracted in the cold and then expanded when it got heated up at the, at the takeoff and it couldn't sustain, so it fell apart. That's your, that's your reason, right? The why, though, that's the how. The why is NASA, an institution that was 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 excusing deviation after deviation and numerous after numerous. It could have been any of them, honestly. And so we have to be careful as there's you avoid know, this 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 uh, this idea of the near miss and to treat these warnings as actually bought time. I mean, in other right. words, this is actually really good, and and it's it's. You know, I often say in the book, it's these aren't random and rare. There may be times when, uh, when you know, we experience this in New England. The governor calls it, uh, you know, a snow day or get off the get off uh, the highways, and then it's not enough. There's no reason to be mad. He's just making a judgment call, right? And the reason why he's keeping you off the road is for what I talked about before, because over 80 people died in the blizzard of 78 or 79 from carbon monoxide poisoning, they didn't die from the blizzard. So, so it's accepting that this is a, an art, not a science, but here's why you should do X, Y, and Z as you have this buildup, because there are things, almost everything we're trying to get better in terms of intelligence. So uh, tornadoes are what we call a rhymes with which you know these tornadoes are the worst i mean anyone in the in the in i grew the, up in kansas city so i know all you about did the, yes, yes no yes. they're the world of worst. tornadoes yeah. yeah you're like yeah they're like they're, you know, they're so destructive and they're, yeah, they're so and they're uh, unpredictable yeah earthquakes we have a little bit of a better warning system as people in california can attest to you i mean even seconds can help save lots of lives hurricanes we do pandemics we're trying to get better at uh so all of these are going to give us some warning uh and we and we have to accept the the sort of 80 percent rule as i call it that, that we won't that you know 20 percent of the time you're going to be like this was a waste of my time but don't don't think that the other the other eight the devil isn't coming the other 80 percent, which is of course the title of the book all right why don't you talk about the title of the book because you definitely yeah, yeah you yeah, no, come it's, back it's, to it over and over again it's, well it is a movie uh which i had i didn't quite realize so i started the book so i when you're in my field, and I, I should say I started off in counterterrorism, I was much more focused on a particular threat. And on a personal level, I don't describe this in the book, but um, my career changed significantly after Hurricane Katrina that I, I thought I've spent, I was in counterterrorism before 9-11. I've spent at that stage seven or eight years of my career. It was, I was in my mid thirties by then, or, or, um, uh, or the first part of my legal career and essentially trying to stop 19 guys from getting on four airplanes. I mean, honestly, that was, I mean, and we, and we succeeded, right? Where there's no, been no massive attack. I don't mean it that way, but it just told me that a nation that was so focused on one threat mm -hmm. couldn't save an American city from drowning. And so I became much more focused on this idea of all hazards or the devil. The devil's, I don't, you know, you, I'm not going to worry myself too much on calculating 
how the likelihood he's going to come. I'm just going to assume he's come. And on the right side of the boom, it's the same eight lessons. You know, I, I say the causes differ. The consequences are always the same. We're going to want to have done a whole bunch of things. So that's, uh, so I, in, in this space, I've spent a lot of time at either at the moment of disaster because I was in government or afterwards because of work I do with communities. And so uh, this, in this case, I had, was out of government by the time of the one year anniversary of Joplin, Missouri, but had known the community. And Joplin, Missouri is a, is a small town uh, that lost over 120 people in about 19 seconds in a tornado that swept down 19th Street uh, uh, in their community. This is, I mean, this the, the, you can't imagine the numbers, right? A small community, that many people. A year later, I meet Jane Cage. Uh, there, they have these, you know, you have these like memorial slash parties. A year later, you're never quite sure what they are. And Jane is this very was a is a widow. She's still alive, and she had taken upon herself to to help Joplin rebuild. So, but it was you know rebuilding in anticipation of more harm could happen. And she was incredibly outgoing, very conservative town. I mean, here we were Obama people. This town was, I think like 96% Mitt Romney. Yeah, that would have been Mitt Romney. And, um, and you know, so welcoming and things. So I say to her, how, like, how are you like this? Like, you know, maybe I need more religion in my life. I mean, she was just great. And she, and but I, I, I note in the book, her religion was not one of passivity or this is what God, you know, this is God's way or, you know, a, a sort of um, a, a passiveness. It was very tactical and operation, operational. And she says, you know, the devil never sleeps. Let me go back. She says, you know, the, the, there's, uh, in Missouri, there will be more, more tornadoes. The devil never sleeps, but he only wins if we don't do better next time. And it really struck me like that, yeah, that's why we do what we do, which is, you know, you're, you're, you're just waiting for the next time and this idea of never again, or, you know, we have to stop everything and why are all these bad things happening? Like maybe, maybe we're being tested in a different way, which is you're not going to be able to stop everything, but, you know, we have agency uh, and if, depending on your religion, maybe God has given us agency to, to, to actually begin to minimize those harms. Well, you talk about the, uh, I'm, I want to make sure that I get the name right. Is it the Fukushima? Fuki yeah, the, right. Fukushima and Onagawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, those are kind of like, to illustrate your point, that there's kind of like a better and a, and a worse way to, to think about the boom, yeah. the coming boom. How does that illustrate your point? Yeah. So this is one of those those things we were e we were emailing about it earlier today. This is one of those stories right, um, that I that I tell in the book because I thought that the only way I could relate this to readers and and the reviews that talk about the book as accessible and not scary like those those are the that's what yeah I'm like yay that's what I was trying to do because I could I can scare people really well but that's not <laughs> my job my job is to say look, here are stories, and I want to just tell you through these stories what is actually going on. So Fukushima, everyone remembers 2011, massive earthquake out of the Japanese sea, uh, massive tornado, 100-foot waves uh, hit Fukushima, uh, the nuclear facility. I should go back and just tell a quick story. The, the nuclear facilities were built in tsunami areas. They had been warned by for 100 years before. There's stones up above the nuclear facilities written by 19th century survivors of tsunamis saying, do not build below these stones. So there's fair warning. They still built, they built homes in the nuclear facilities. Also, I should say the other history that animates why Fukushima happened was of course the history of Japan as a target of nuclear war uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why is that relevant? It's because as, as Japan began to build nuclear facilities, it had to convince the Japanese public uh, that there wouldn't be another nuclear disaster. So it sold the myth, right, of never again. It sold the myth of perfect safety. It sold the myth that we don't need to learn to fail safer. So Fukushima is owned by TEPCO, the largest nuclear company in Japan. It's a, it's, it's like, you know, it's like calling it like a BP or one, like, you know, one of the majors. And, uh, and they basically did not train themselves to fail safely. So when the waters are coming, 
they're basically not empowered. The boom has happened and they're, you know, you're sort of, okay, well, we lost, right? There's their response capacity is limited. They haven't done the training culturally. They sort of are required to call Tokyo where headquarters are for every decision that they want to make. So that doesn't work in real time. Down the street though, the story we never hear about, I'm, I'm sure most people on this call have never, didn't know there was a nuclear facility uh, that suffered major damage by the earthquake, got flooded by the tsunami, uh, worse actually, but did not radiate, uh, did not have a radiation leak. And that's in the world of not, you know, less bad. This is my less bad standard. Well, so what was good about Onagawa? It's a smaller company and its leadership believed in failing safely. They believed that a lot could be done to protect the nuclear facility. Most importantly, they empowered uh, the leadership and had a very strong safety team to make decisions in real time. Onagawa had about three and a half minutes. This is very non-technical of me to shut down, turn off the light switch of the radiation facility or the facilities uh, that would have radiated. Uh, and they did it. They just, they knew exactly what to do and they failed safer. So many, many years later, neither facility is working. So I'd make that clear. Both were damaged. Neither facility is up and running again, uh, but only one radiated, uh, uh, had radiation leakage that, requ that has required, it's, a, it's an uninhabitable space. Uh, for in in that in that uh, precinct in that area in Fukushima, was this sort of an example of letting the perfect be the enemy of the good? Yeah. And because you can't uh, you can't acknowledge that that it won't be perfect, then you're just sort of like, well, we're just going to turn a blind eye. Yeah, it is. It's so there's a, everyone wants to know why why are we so bad at this? Well, what is yeah. we're not always so bad at it. So I give lots of examples in which. Things are working. We just don't. You just don't get credit for it because they're working. So, like the Suez Canal. Well, well then yeah. wait. So, talk about the paradox of prevention because yeah, I think this is one yeah. so deeply ironic. Yeah. Um, so where you're kind of punished for doing a good job. Right. So let's assume Fukushima. So this is called the preparedness paradox. So everyone's going to be a disaster management wonk by the end of this. This is something called the preparedness paradox, and it's a it's a real thing. It's a thing we talk about. So the so the. There's many reasons why people don't prepare. One of them is what you were describing, Gretchen, like, you know, oh, everything is fine. Nothing bad will happen. You know, the sort of, you can't get your head around it and you sort of won't let your brain go there. Uh, but another reason is actually quite, uh, can be documented and that's called the preparedness paradox. And it basically just goes, the more that you prepare for a potential disaster or crisis, the less, like, the less likely that the consequences will be harmful, right? So that, Later, people will wonder why did you invest so much time, worry, commitment to it, and well, why? I would, yeah, I was staggered by your example of Y two K. I think you said it was like three hundred to six hundred billion dollars were spent yeah. on Y two K, and people are like, Y two K was nothing. Yeah, why did exactly. we get all fussed about exactly. it? And you're like, yeah, six hundred billion dollars <laughs> later, right? I mean, right? No, it's totally. It's like you know, like when you work really hard on something, and someone will say, you you know, you know, but of course, or you're right. lucky, and you're like, no actually I worked really hard on it yeah. and then no, you get no credit for it. So, so this is exactly right. There's a Y2K is a perfect example. We're worried about the, the, the um, computers uh, in, in uh, December 31st, 1999, the year is gonna, this, the century is gonna change. Uh, they're worried that it's gonna go to 1000 or 0000, 000, 000, 000 and, uh, and screw everything up. Billions of dollars. There's a federal statute called essentially the Y2K statute, which authorizes companies to do certain things, share information. So then the new year comes, there are disruptions. They're not major, they're you know, minor, minor ones in Australia and South Korea and like not a big deal. Some, a few things here, uh, but everyone parties like it's 1999 and the lights stay on. Uh, and immediately the narrative of you all were freaking out, right? And yeah, exactly, exactly. What is your problem? And so that's the preparedness paradox. And the only way out of it is what I urge in the book, which is right. You're, you because the devil's always coming. You have to have perpetual preparedness. You can't do this anymore because the the devil's always coming, right? So these these are the eight you know eight steps that I talk about from you know communications to lessons learned that are absolutely key. Um, well, speaking of lessons learned, I mean, you've been involved with many kind of major, major disasters. Yeah. What would you say is sort of the most formative 
disaster, what most shaped your, your outlook of the ones that you personally had yeah. to be, you know, you know, you were deeply involved with? Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many, well, each of them should have impacted you in other way. And it, and it depends on what my role was. So, uh, so the, the, as, as the counterterrorism person, as I said earlier, so I'll start with Hurricane Katrina, that was really, for a lot of us in the field, that was, it wasn't that we abandoned counterterrorism. We just sort of viewed terrorism as we would other threats. And that, that was probably healthy for the country as well at that time by 2005, given what had happened. On a, on a tactical, I'm exhausted, this was really hard, was when I was put as the civilian deputy, there was two deputies to the BP oil spill, um, uh, for the BP oil spill. So once again, this is where narrative matters. So I'm the assistant secretary, but then put into this weird thing that is formed. I won't get into all the legal mumbo jumbo. So was the BP oil spill response a success? Absolutely, right? I don't care what all that noise was about, whatever, then, you know, we didn't lose an ocean. And the more important thing is, and it's not just because he was my boss, but when one talks about Obama's two terms, do you even think about the BP oil spill? No, it's barely a blip. Like, I mean, it's just that success, something bad happened. We had a very, very slow initial response. We can't close the well for a hundred days, but we're doing everything to make things less bad. We're not making them good. My God, oil is coming into the ocean. The Gulf is back up and running, you know, within a, a year, the claims are reformed and, you know, 11 people died, of course, that's the, 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 the tragedy. But in terms of the systemic harm, uh, and the calculations we were making, balancing the environment with, with oil spill cleanup, cleanup and dispersants, I think we made the right judgments, even though it looked, it's a disaster. It's gonna look like a freaking disaster. We get it. And this one lasted a hundred days. So that really taught me on the personal level, sort of thinking about disasters and the narrative that is going on, not because we're, it's not communication strategy. It is like literally like, yes, oil will hit shore. Like, I can't stop that at this stage. I'm on the right side of the boom. Like, if you think that oil isn't going to hit shore, you've never seen oil and water before, right? But here's, here's what we're doing to make sure that less oil is hitting shore than might otherwise have occurred because of the dispersing and stuff. And then I should say the pandemic, if I could, you know, just on a, as a mother, that's the one that hit me as a mother. All of us have our stories and we had every you know, come on, I had every privilege in the world in terms of making things comfortable. But, you know, I had two kids, one leave college, one in high, two in high school, one applying to college. I'm here, I'm busier than I've ever been in my life professionally because of my work on advising companies and mayors and governors. I'm, um, and I'm trying to keep people's heads on straight through, through my columns and, and being on CNN. And I, you know, and, and you know, you just want to cur curl up in a, as, as a very social person also, I, you know, it's just, it, it hit me, you know, I sort of, I look at pictures of myself, let's just put it this, I'm sure we all do this, like something will come up on your camera, like January, 2020, and you look, you're like, I was 15 years younger and I look so innocent. <laughs> I always say to David, my husband, I'm so pretty then, <laughs> you know, because you have no idea what's about to happen. So yeah, that was on the personal level. Um, well, back to the, the spill for a minute, because one thing that really struck me in the book was that you talked about how that um, there were all these preventive mechanisms, kind of fail safes, like six of them, one yeah. which failed after another. Yeah. Now, that seems to be the kind of thing that is supposed to be like unthinkable, like, yeah. you know, each one is supposed to be unthinkable. So how could they all six? Is this the normalization of deviance? Is this yeah. greed? So people are just like signing off forms where it's not real. Like, right. how does that happen? Same thing with the challenger. I assume there's supposed yeah. to be so many layers. You sort of feel like, well, you kind of feel like, well, it would be impossible right. for, for, for it to fail so spectacularly. It's so, it's right. too big to fail kind of. Right, no, exactly. And I think, so I think a lot of companies get into this. So part of it is, I also tell the stories where the unimaginable is imagined and therefore less harm is done. So Suez Canal is a perfect example that did not cause, of all the stuff we're dealing with supply chain now is related to other things, that did not cause a global disruption because of how the industry was able to adapt. They went to the 
Cape of Good Horn in Africa. People don't know this story, right? So they're looking at the tugboat trying to move the <laughs> ever given, right? The favorite, but it's actually, there's something else, you know, going on, which is there's an adaptation. So I, I, I yeah, and, and talk about too big to fail. No, the Suez is closed, but it turns out the Suez was closed uh, for many years uh, between, uh, uh, during the wars in the Middle East. And so the, the industry learned to adapt. So I tell that story, I say like, don't think, they don't think um, it's people can imagine the unimaginable and therefore it becomes manageable because they've imagined it before they have that pivot. So the BP oil spill is one example where and I, this is the, um, uh, the the chapter that's called uh, beware or beware of the last line of defense crutch. I forget the exact language that we ended up with, but the or the last line of defense crutch. What in, in any security system think of your own home, you know, there's always like, well, there's always mom, you know, and you're like, okay, that's, you know, what if I'm not there? Or what if I'm traveling, right? There's always that. So you want to just challenge your assumptions about the last line of defense. And not just because it's generally easy to find other lines of defense, you have what we call redundancies, but because that puts a lot of pressure on the last line of defense, whether it's an individual to make sure everything is working, or it's a system that like a, what's called the blowout preventer in the BP oil spill, because BP believed in this last line of defense. So I retell the story of BP. A lot of people think, well, it had nothing or whatever. Actually, it's not true. They, they had a system of security, as you said, but because they didn't have any redundancies or any planning around the last line of defense failing, they, they didn't know how to close the well. I mean, it really, it wasn't like it was impossible. They eventually knew how to do it. It was just, they had never done a, 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 well, a well closure that far down in the ocean because they just believed it couldn't happen. The technology wasn't that hard once they once they figured out how to close it. And so just telling that story would be like, you know what, like th this would have been an easy and less expensive fix if they had only imagined being on the right side of the boom, right? That, that the blowout preventer would fail. Well, it's funny because uh, you describe how your sort of your, your astonishment when you sort of come into a company or a situation and you're like, okay, let's run the disaster. And they're like, oh, that could never happen. Like, yes, why are we going to waste our time? And you're like, Oh wait, yes it could. And then and then in the state of Massachusetts, you're like, well, what if we take out the governor? What yeah. if something happens to the governor? And people are like, oh right, like yeah, where is the lieutenant? Like yeah. you got to think about the lieutenant governor, right? Right, exactly. Now I tell the story of I do a lot of training and table. Now that I'm out of government, I work a lot with the private sector now as well, and I do a lot of trainings. And but I also do public sector ones. So I, this was there's a couple states, many states actually where. Governors and lieutenant governors are, can come from different parties. I think North Carolina is one of them. Um, and this it's like they're, you know, in, on in different islands, right? It's just the way, the nature of the state constitution. And so in this state, we go in and we're going to do a tabletop. And, and the constitution says, you know, lieutenant governor follows in the governor's footsteps should something happen to the governor. And uh, the governor's office is like many governor's offices. It's all about the governor. And we walk in and we don't see anyone from lieutenant governor's office. So we go to a back room and we're like, we're going to change this. And we walk in, it's a hurricane drill. And, um, and I drown the governor. I mean, and you should have seen that they're like, I was like, no, 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 he's, he, he was in the wrong he's place. Out. The wrong side. He's just, he's out. And you just see an entire time the governor's pissed. I mean, he's like, because he, <laughs> he knows this is not responsible, right? On the part of his staff, uh, that they don't have a lieutenant governor's office, uh, blame the staff whenever you're the governor. And so he looks around and someone says, we got to call the lieutenant governor. It's like, yeah, you do. Like, you know, don't let politics get away. But it's, look, that's a simple fix that any kind of basic training is going to get you to and get you just much more comfortable in the headspace of, of thinking through, right, and boom, that's all just failing safer, right? I'm not getting you to perfection. I'm not getting you to safe. I'm not getting you to good. I'm just getting you to less bad. And that's actually success, right? And we can measure it. We can measure it in numbers, right? And that's that's the other thing I do in terms of tsunamis and Boston Marathon and the pandemic. Well, you just mentioned a tabletop and I thought that was interesting. So explain like what a tabletop is, yeah. what red teaming is and like yeah. what the process is for, for trying to get your hand, your, your mind right. around, how do we make this less bad? 
Right. So there's, and there's all these, different, there's very expensive ways to do it. There are very easy ways to do it. And so the first chapter is called get your head around it, because I just want to bring people to the right side of the boom, because it is so, everyone is on the left side of the mirror. It's like, I'm going to stop it. Nothing bad will happen. You know, we're, we're, we're going to put all this money into doing X, Y, and Z, or we, we dream of a more resilient world. Like it's always past, right? I'm going to stop it from having or future, but it's never now. So I want to get people's headspace in the sort of you are here. This is the, the, the recurring that every chapter ends with you are here. Like the devil is here. You don't have to, don't blame someone later, dream of unicorns and rainbows later, you are here. And so one way to, to, to test the you are here, how strong and, and are your, are, is your capacity and to get you comfortable, I mean, just to, it, it literally just calms you, right? Is to just walk through a scenario. How would this actually unfold? So there's different ways to do it. Some are uh, tabletops where you sit around a table and just sort of walk through it. If you're a small company, like what would happen? And others are real, real exercises where people sort of are actually moving in real time. This is what the military does. Uh, red teaming or um, uh, uh, benign hackers or whatever you want to call them. These are uh, people that you pay or, or come in uh, on the military uh, to try to disrupt your system so that you're, you're prepared when it happens. So a lot of companies uh, will, will get hackers to try to get into their system. Uh, and so we're getting better about learning in real time. And there's this whole uh, management and leadership theory about um, you know, sort of learning in the moment, how, how, you know, sort of coming from the business world in terms of assessments and stuff. It's just how do you pivot in real time as the information is telling you that you have to move in a different direction or you have to pivot in this way. Uh, this part sounds really wonky, but I, I try to illustrate it with sort of here's how it works in 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 the moment here's how you can learn in real time so that you're you're able to adapt whether you're the family who sort of finds themselves say you know stuck or or isolated in their home what are the things you wish you had done or separated uh, uh or you're the ceo of a massive company both neither is an expert but both can be we're all crisis managers now right um, well, I was very struck in your story about the Boston Marathon, about how one of the, the really important things to do was to, to, to help people find each other so that then they would leave. Yeah. And this is sort of seems kind of straightforward, but, and, but it's actually incredibly important for just so, managing the chaos. Yeah. Someone once told me that if there's any global phenomenon, you see it in Ukraine now, if there's any global phenomenon uh, or global connectivity in a disaster, because the causes will all differ. It is a parent's desire to find their children. Like the family unification uh, is, is, is like no other desire. We saw it with the tsunami as well. I mean, they, they sort of joke that there's like a pecking order. It's like, you, know, you, know, you ask, how are my children? Uh, how are my parents? Uh, this is sort of unfair how's my spouse tends to be third because you should probably view them as an equal right yeah yeah they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll sort themselves out yeah, exactly exactly and then how's my pet yeah and then how am i that it goes in that order but how are my kids is and um is key and so we focus a lot and so this is what i urge families to do is to focus a lot where you don't want to go, which is how would you get your family together? We, we know this is the urge. Is there's not going to be no surprise again. Something will happen. Your only urge is your family unification. And I give some, some ideas around how to think about family unification. I use the Boston Marathon where, very importantly, uh, they focus on family unification, not just for the stress of it. Remember, there's, there's runners. They don't know what happened. They're being stopped at mile 26. Anyone who's been to the Boston Marathon, which is this weekend, knows that the family is on the other side uh, of the finish line. That's now exploded. They need to get 20,000, however many people are left, out of there because it's a massive crime scene. There are three immediate fatalities, deaths. And there are 297 people who have lost a limb, an arm, a hand. Now, this is my good news story out of the Boston Marathon. You clear family unification, you get people together and they did it through a complicated 
they, they essentially moved the finish line to Commonwealth Avenue. I wish I could, exp I wish I had a map. Uh, Commonwealth people who know Boston is sort of parallel to Boylston Street, which is the fin famous finish line street. So they just moved them about two blocks down, got people back together uh, and got them out of there. And then here's where we, how we measure success. It's a tragedy that the brothers weren't stopped, but we're not gonna stop everything. It's a tragedy that three people didn't die at the finish line. As we know, a fourth of a police officer would die later that week. Uh, but the 297, if you were one of the 290, of the 297 who had to be taken to area hospitals, if you made it to a hospital, you did not die. You did not die. That's your, that's your number. And and people will look will look at other metrics, right? Rightfully so. But the metric that we might say, gosh, a lot of preparing and planning went into the triage and the pivoting. I oversaw the state's uh, response to the Boston Marathon when I was state homeland security advisor. I was out of government by this by this time. You know, if I, if I'm gonna judge tragedy, you know, bad bad and less bad, I I, I want I want. I want those numbers, right? As compared to another 297 dead or another couple dozen dead. So we have to remember that's when we talk about things like Boston Strong, I mean, that's what it's about. It's about keeping that number small um, and being able to uh, uh, save the lives of nearly 300 people in that moment of the boom. And was that because they truly had planned for something like some kind of catastrophic? Our, 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 our planning, I mean, this is now public, but uh, our planning was uh, a, was a, was a bomb scenario at the finish line. It was, it was an explosion. I can't remember if it was a bomb. I think it was slightly different than what we saw. And it was only one. And the thought was, what would you do? Now we, they lucked out. I was in a government again. They lucked out that, you know, this is sort of like today. There's, there's moments that you say, okay, this is how... The, the bombing took place at three o'clock. That is the uh, medical switch time. And you have to remember how Boston marathons work. You have the elite runners run through, they're done in like, you know, two hours, right? Then all the VIP leave, all the VIP, VIPs leave. So for a city like Boston, you know, four hours into it, these, you know, that, that, that's, that's me, but even later, right? These are the slower runners, the ones who are, um, and so a lot of the cities sort of back up and running, right? So it's just sort of, you're, you're not in that, that, that finish line mode. Uh, but it was a normal 3 p.m. transition of, of your medical facilities. So uh, you had double duty at the hospitals. Uh, uh, yeah. So just that's, by luck. Just by luck. But the not luck part is a triage system that would move the least harm to Rhode Island or New Hampshire. So we have what's called mutual aid. That we test all the time with other states so i'm moving you know we're moving people we're testing to move people to other states uh and there's uh as i said some of this can look like dances right these are dances that that are trained and so you can put you pivot in real time because something new is going to happen uh, but it's not like it's foreign uh and that's that's the investments in that preparedness uh that came into that came into play at least on that monday so it's not like you can't exactly predict what's going to happen, but you do enough so that people like feel that familiarity and that like, I know my job or I know yeah. how to pass right. the so baton. This is, this is actually it. So in the in the wonky parts of the book, I describe what's called the incident command system. People always always look at disasters, look, disasters look crazy bad and everything looks chaotic. It is not true. Almost every discipline works by something called the incident command system. And if you're interested in this on a more practical level, uh, you can actually get trained for it online. There's free classes. And just very quickly, incident command is just a hierarchical system that is what we call plug and play. So it, it allows first responders or volunteers even with the Red Cross to, to, to come into a disaster zone and know exactly what they're doing because there's different divisions there's logistics and planning and finance and sheltering and it's just a I'm basic looking I think I you have a chart of it so I'm yeah, looking to see if have, I can yeah, find the chart I while know, you're talking I know. keep talking um, so, I'll see if I can find uh, it yeah I think it's in the early on I'll find it yeah. um so uh yeah I do show what so so the most important thing is have you ever wondered I'll talk while you're looking for it it's before page 56 of it yay so that's an incident command system excellent uh, yeah, we don't do slides. That's a very complicated one. Um, 
So just the thing to know about it is, it's not just hierarchical, it's plug and play. So if you've ever wondered, like, you'll, you know, if you're in Chicago and you'll, you'll hear 50 Chicago firefighters are going to California to help with the wildfires. And you're like, oh, really? Yeah. And all they do, they literally get dropped into an incident command system. They're told you're in, you're in division E4 dealing with uh, supply chain. And they know like literally there's no training, they like know exactly what to do. And it's a system that has been built up over the decades. So there is a foundation, it has to be able to pivot and respond. Um, and that's, and that's, the, that's, the, that's what you're looking at when you look at disaster management, which we're all a part of now, as we saw with COVID, right? I mean, we, we, all, we, all, we all were part of that, that risk calculation about individually, school-wise, whatever, what risk calculations were we going to make? Well, I want to ask you one last question. I think Lonnie's going to come back in because I know we've right. had some questions from the audience. Um, the last thing I would say is like, you know, you mentioned your family. Um, how do you think about talking to your children about disasters so that they are, you know, appropriately yeah. conscientious and attentive, um, but not overwhelmed with anxiety? Um, some yeah, children are too question. cavalier and then some some get very, very worried. Right. So, so the most important thing is they're modeling their behavior off of you. So if you are standing in front of the TV, I used to say to my girlfriends who are like, Jimmy's very nervous and he's seeing a therapist. And then like, I hear my girlfriend screaming at Trump on the TV. I was like, well, I wonder why, because you're saying the world is going to hell in a handbasket or whatever your politics are. So, you know, part of it, they're just modeling off of us. So the, as, so that's why agency is important for adults because our kids are gonna model off of it. And, um, and as I say in the book, as I show, the, the people who weather, this, this is people who didn't have financial or, or physical harm from COVID, just people who had to act a certain way, who responded the best during COVID in terms of both mental and physical adaptability. Uh, there was a major longitudinal study. This will not surprise people who watch zombie movies. It's people who watch zombie movies or scary movies. Why was that? Because they could actually accept that the harm was coming, but also manage it in a way that wasn't crazy. So part of it is our kids are modeling off of us. You have to take, and then on your kid yourself, you have to, you, you know your kid better than I do. Uh, some kids worry more, some don't. My general belief my kids are being raised in a city is that my kids know more than I think they know in terms of their vulnerabilities. So I've, I've been talking to them early. It doesn't hurt that it's, that it's, you know, my job um, and, and basically give them things to do. You can't just say, you know, mommy's going to take care of you. You want them to be responsible uh, ch children as well as adults. I was not particularly strict about phones. I like having connectivity to my kids and I like them having independence. So some of it's gonna depend on your parenting type. Um, you know, if you're a hovering parent, this is gonna be different. I was, I was, I, I, that's not how I was parenting um, in terms of the kid's ability to move around and stuff or to, to be around the city. So you're gonna have to make a judgment call. But my general sense is, is they probably know more they're feeding off of your anxiety. So try to get rid of it uh, and give them something to do, as we say, you know, give them some, give them agency as well. Excellent. And now to Lonnie. Yay, hi, Lonnie. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen. Great, great interview. So much content. I love when it's just a fire hose and you are 100% fire hose, Juliet. Just love every minute of it. Um, more Juliet at After Hours. Buy a copy of The Devil Never Sleeps. It's such a great book. There's so oh, much in there. We've really, even with everything you talked about, you're still just scratching the surface. Yeah. Uh, come to After Hours. You can ask your own questions. I know that there's going to be, you know, fan audience. There's a lot of parents and fan audience. I'm sure their ears were... Uh, Picking up, especially towards the end, as you were talking about some stuff, I was curious. I'll ask you at after hours a little bit about um, that. You seem to have a little bit more of a lenient view towards kids and phones, which are a point of such high distress for so many parents yeah. and anxiety. So that's interesting that the security expert is a little bit more yeah, mellow. Yeah, but they, but I do, I, I take them when they were in the house. I take them away at night. So okay. when they're, you know, so, so no, because you're you're just balancing. I mean, this is the thing is like. As you can tell, someone said, how are you in this field or how do you write about this? I said, I'm not a perfectionist. Like the idea that as a mother, as a professional, like I have made, you know, I, you know, God knows about all the mistakes that one makes, but that's, that's how I think about it is I'm just, 
we're, we're making calculations at all times. So just give yourself a break. And, you know, it, it, for me, it was the connectivity in the, in the security situation. All right. So we, we're at 7.56. We have four minutes. Uh, I have two questions I want to get in. They're okay, both good. kind of biggish. So pretend you're on CNN right now and you don't I will. have a lot I'll of time. I will. do the one minute. All right, Cindy, um, and you can go in either order. Cindy is asking if you could just say uh, some discussion a little bit about the war in Ukraine, what, yeah. what is hitting you on that? And then Faye is asking, uh, how do you apply this idea of approach to the environmental and climate change effects that are awaiting us in the future? So climate and Ukraine, ready, set, Okay, go. quickly. Here's my, okay, so let's do Ukraine first. Uh, lots of so the same lessons that I talk about. For one, good message, good messenger. Nothing like the righteous to get uh, to get people organized and rallying. If, if Zelensky had left Ukraine, it would have been over for that country. So that's important. And the second, my second takeaway, there's a, well, quickly aside, there's a cybersecurity issue in terms of Homeland Security, but I, I'll focus on the war itself, is exactly what I talk about in the book, which is like logistics, it's it's literally, it's not rocket science, it's about planning and uh, and Russia didn't do it for its army. Uh, it we're, we're, the Ukrainians are suffering the consequences of this as, as they depart in terms of the horrors that we're seeing and the war crimes. Uh, but when you can't feed your troops, when you can't fix their tanks, when, you're, when you, you cannot keep them alive on the battlefield, basic uh, provisions. That's your strategy, right? And then everyone talks about Putin's plans. Here's Putin's plans. He has no food for his army, right? So this is why they're receding. So th those are sort of two takeaways. But as I say, you know, righteous cause, righteous, righteous communications. Those you don't get better than that in terms of getting people uh, galvanized. In terms of the long term issues, I'm, I'm I'm so glad someone asked that. So I am absolutely, you know, prepared. Uh, to or, or wanting for the world to be better in terms of climate change. I, 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 I talk about and focus on mitigation measures, on, on, on accepting defeat in terms of what's called managed retreat. There are places that we can't live in anymore. But I do, and I'm clear about this in the book, this book is about now. This book is about not, is about, I could blame everyone, right, in the past for why we're here, and I can dream of a world in which that's not going to come, in which we're prepared and resilient for the climate ahead. What I really focus on is 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 that moment of the the truncated time to deal with the climate disaster, the hurricane, the tornado, the seawater rise, and then what can we do to minimize that harm? I don't, I don't give up on the past or the future. I promise you, I do not. Uh, but those books have been written, and I wanted to write a very, very different book. Thanks for those comments. Um, Gretchen, I want to thank you so much for such a great, thank thoughtful so interview great. with Juliet. Thank really, you so really. Much Thank you for including me in the evening. I oh, enjoyed so it. Fantastic. Yeah, really appreciate your framing everything. Juliet, you want to say anything as we exit? We have one no, minute. I just, oh, no, I just want to thank everyone for being on. Well, I'll be back on CNN tonight, and I, but I hope you could come. In between, we're going to do author hours, uh, which I'm so excited about. And just want to thank uh, Lonnie and the whole team at the Family Action Network. For, I, got, I didn't know about you before the invitation, and I did some research and everything you do for the community and for keeping this alive during COVID and keeping us together. I, 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 I'm, I I'm a book writer, I'm like Gretchen, where like, I'm like one a decade, right? One every six or seven years, Gretchen picks them out once a year. So next decade, <laughs> I hope the pandemic's over and I can That's come right. visit. But I do want to thank my friend, uh, Gretchen, who's like just uh, remarkable what she has built and what she does for so many people. Uh, to also make things less bad, which I think is, that's, right. is, is that's a that's not a bad place to be. <laughs> and Gretchen, keep us in mind when the next book comes out, you yes. have a, a red carpet in family here. Would love to host you. 